Pierre, you want to come out here? Hey everyone and welcome. Today I will be showing how to dockerize your web application and put them onto Google Cloud. And we'll be running that through Google Cloud Cloud Run. And so to give an overview of the lesson today, what we will be doing is building apps in the following frameworks, including RShiny, Flask within Python, and Streamlit also in Python. So the idea here is to show that this applies to whatever framework you're using, and these are all very common in the data science space. And then we'll deploy through Google Cloud. We'll set up all our code that we write into GitHub or Bitbucket. I'll show examples of both and we will run through Google Cloud, their Cloud Run service, which essentially takes whatever your Docker container is that's linked to your GitHub or Bitbucket, and then it deploys it for you to a web server. So as I said, I will be deploying three different apps through three different web app frameworks and two different languages. And I think it's really important to compare the frameworks in order to appropriately see how they compete for potentially being the right framework for your problem and project. You can't compete when you can't compare here. So when I want to learn something, I typically think about it in two different ways. How useful is the skill that I am about to try to learn? And then how easy is it going to be? Like how big of a lift is it going to be based on my background? How hard is the skill going to be to learn? So to start, we have R Shiny, which is based in R. And I give it a seven in usefulness. The reason I give it that is, you know, it really is useful. And R is a lot of data science predicting values with models. So taking a model and making it a web application is really valuable. And ease, I would give a seven. Definitely takes a little bit of a learning curve, but isn't close to as difficult as something like a Flask. So next we have Flask written in Python. I give it a usefulness of a 9, because if you really want to do a full-fledged SaaS-based business, back-end of an API, front-end web app with your HTML templates, this is the right tool for you. I think if you're ever going to scale anything really large, you see a lot of big tech companies, they'll hire for Flask backends, because the Flask backend can go with a React front-end really easily as well. So the usefulness of knowing this skill is really high. However, the ease is pretty difficult. You really need to know HTML, CSS, and kind of how to actually build <laughs> a front-end web app from scratch. Relative to Shiny and Streamlit is more their pre-compiled packages. You probably don't need to really know how they work, just that they do, uh, while Flask is very more in-depth. So to round it out, we have Streamlit, which I would give probably the lowest of usefulness, just because they're doing a lot of development now. They just got acquired, the company did, and I think they have some full-time devs working on it now. I would just say the usefulness is lower because it's a, a younger framework. Uh, with time comes more features, especially in the open source community. So uh, I think it's got a big ceiling to actually grow pretty pretty robustly. Uh, and then I would give the ease at a seven as well. If you're f more familiar with Python, uh, this will be probably more at a nine, especially if you understand how functions are structured because that's how the streamlit apps are written are as Python functions. So uh, yeah, I would give ease at a seven. And so now the question is, which one do you choose? And the goal of this video is to not choose one for you. It is just to show you all the different options and for you to be able to see me weigh the pros and cons for how I think. And that's really the goal is I'm just going to show you the rest of how you would do each and every one. And then hopefully you can line up your requirements per your project per maybe some of my suggestions. It'll never be the same again like Derek Rose. So I would never attempt to try to explain Docker in this short period of time. But the big thing to know is that it really is the game changer. We're going to take all these apps that we do work in, we're going to put it into a Docker file, and that's kind of the standardized way that a lot of programmers have collapsed on building services as they are lightweight. Uh, at a very high level, a Docker container is an operating system. 
So for example, if you have a Windows machine and you have unnecessary programs on your machine, that's the operating system and they've been added on. The point of Docker is that you are building a very lean operating system so that you know that Xbox program on your machine that comes default because it's a Windows machine, all Microsoft, you get rid of all that kind of junk and you're only using what you need. And that's why the whole coding community has kind of collapsed onto it. So once again, I won't really get into many of the details of the technical side of Docker, but just know that a lot of people are using this, so it really is worth your time of learning. So we'll start with the general structure of an R Shiny app. And if you navigate to this Bitbucket link below in the description, you'll see all these examples. And for this example, we have a Docker file for our Shiny. There's a lot of comments in here if you are interested, but essentially we take the Shiny image, we take that, we add a couple other uh, Linux dependencies, we install some packages within R, and then we take our code base that our Shiny app is in, a folder called Shiny app, and then we run the server. And as you'll see up in the folder structure, we have Shiny app as the directory, we have an app.r file, we have a UI, and we have a server. And these are the two big components to make a Shiny app run, is you need all the HTML, which is essentially all this UI. You need that, and then some server that runs some functions, and together they will build a web application for you. So that is the general structure of the code base in Bitbucket for an R Shiny app. Walk around in a cloud of it all day long. <sighs> to the cloud, like Microsoft. All right, you realize that that's just a cloud of data pushing itself wirelessly through different devices. <laughs> now who sounds big? So now that we have the R Shiny app in Bitbucket, let's put that app into Google Cloud and get it out to the internet. So we're gonna log into cloud.google.com. Then we're gonna go over to the hamburger menu. We're gonna go down to Cloud Run and select that. Once we get to the Cloud Run menu, we're gonna create a service. And we're gonna to want to link it to our Bitbucket account. So we're gonna say continuously de deploy new revisions. It's gonna use a service called Cloud Build on the back end, but you don't really need to know that. And we'll see the R Shiny site that I had is called Shiny Site. We'll say next. It's going to be listening to a Docker file. Let's just check what the branch name is. It's called master. So let's go back and say master. And we'll save that. And since I already have one, it's going to make me rename it to shiny site new. And I'll just show that as an example. I need to allow traffic to get to it. And then for our shiny, the port is 3838. And now we'll create it. And just so you do know, this will take a second. I would say about five to 10 minutes, you for sure should have your app running on the cloud service. So I'll let this go and I'll see you back when it's fully baked. All right, looks like it's done. If you go over, it'll probably leave you on this metrics tab. You're really gonna be interested in the revisions tab. And so you'll wanna see that there's definitely a green check mark here, which means you know, it listened to Bitbucket, everything got deployed all right and you will be also interested in this URL up here. So this is actually where your web app is being hosted. So if I click on this, it'll take me to my app. And so it's just a basic little app. I was playing around with some CSS. So this actually updates your CSS and themes and you notice the fonts as well. But this is just a good example of a little web app that you can deploy pretty quickly and the prices of all this is relatively cheap as well. So now we'll take a look at how to deploy a Flask app. So Flask, if you remember, is a framework in Python. So to go through that, we're gonna go through the Docker file. We're gonna grab the Python image. We're gonna have a working directory called code. 
We're going to tell it app.py is our app. Then we're going to host it on our local instance, our server. And in this case, that's the Docker container. We're going to install everything from requirements.txt and then expose port 5000 and then run the Flask container. To take a look at the actual app, super simple. We're just going to return a web page that says a Flask app. Simple. And these are the only requirements. These are pretty common, Flask, G-Unicorn, and requests. So those are going to be the packages in Python that we need installed. Now that we have the code of our Flask app in Bitbucket, we're going to want to now deploy it onto Google Cloud. So once again, create service, select the continuously deploy, set up cloud build, We're going to go over to our Bitbucket account, GCP Flask. This one's called main. We're going to look at our Docker file. And that's pretty much it. We need to allow traffic to come through. And if you remember in our Docker file, we specified port 5000. Once again, it'll take a second to set up, and we'll let that do that, and I'll come back. We can go over to GCP Flask. Once again, we'll go over to Revisions. Let's make sure that that green check mark is there. It's good to go. You'll see it just now did it. And once again, we'll go to the URL, and it's just going to say a Flask app. Perfect. Last but not least, we have Streamlit, the Python framework. And for this, there's actually going to be no app file. All I'm going to do is clone their example. So I can walk through this example really quick. We have a Python container. We are going to expose port 8501. So when we go back over to GCP, that's what we're going to be looking at. We have a couple other Linux dependencies. Then if we go to this example repo, we'll see an app file, and I'm just copying this whole repo with the requirements.txt and the app. And this is just a basic app, welcome to Streamlit. So remember that when we deploy the welcome to Streamlit title. And then once again, installing the requirements and then running the Streamlit app. So that is the very basic structure of the Streamlit app one file to deploy. So now that we have our very basic Streamlit app up, let's make a service for it. So we're gonna create service, we're gonna set up another cloud build, we're gonna go over to Bitbucket, then we're gonna say GCP Streamlit, we'll set up that Docker file again. Once again, go down here, allow traffic to come through. And if you remember, 8501 is the port that we exposed in our Docker file. Let's let that bake, and I'll see you back when it's done. So now that it's done, let's take a look at our revision for our Streamlit app. Make sure we have the green check mark. We'll go over to the URL. And you'll see, this is a pretty good example of a Streamlit app. There's a couple inputs here. This plot slash chart is listening to the inputs. So if I change these values, it's gonna change the plot. So that's a really good example and a use case of Streamlit. So I know it wasn't listed, but I think it's worth noting that a lot of times you actually probably don't need a web application. And this is where I would suggest something like a Jupyter Notebook. If you're kind of just enabling other data scientists to work in a place with Python and R, this is a pretty good option. So yeah, I actually wanted to briefly show as kind of a little bonus how to host a Jupyter Notebook in Google Cloud Platform. So for this example, we'll show how to run out of GitHub. It's gonna be the exact same as Bitbucket, but I did wanna show that if you choose either, it doesn't really matter with Google Cloud. So for this, we have a Docker file, and the Docker file is a Jupyter Notebook image. I set the token as high. Remember that when we go to our example URL, 
and then I'm enabling Jupyter Lab, and I'm also setting up the Jupyter Notebook to run on that particular IP address. And then I have requirements of Jupyter's, Pandas, and Flask. So that is the general overview of the Docker container for a Jupyter Notebook. All right, so now that we have the Docker file composed, let's make a service for this. So once again, we'll go over to set up with cloud build. And this time we're actually gonna to listen to GitHub. So we'll go down to Docker Notebook. Click next. And we'll choose Docker file in our main branch. Once again, allow traffic to come through. And the port for this service is not specified in Docker, but it's commonly known to be 8888. And we'll create this instance and be back when it's done. Oh, it's easy. Yeah. I make this shit look easy. Oh, yeah. but it ain't that easy, believe me. Oh, yeah. I guess it's easy to me. Oh, yeah. Although I am joking lightly, I know this is a lot, and really don't worry. A lot of these tools are really evolving quickly, but I think the big thing is to understand how important Docker files are to a DevOps process through this. And if you can get your head around Docker files and building operating systems as services, that helps a lot. If you need some help along the way, I'm here to help. Uh, Matt Majestic at proton.me. So that's one way to reach me or check out my GitHub or mattmajestic.com. Thanks. Hope it helped. Dog, here's a pair on us, fool. Oh, bitch. I don't know what to say. You don't need to say anything. We got you, dog. You're our boy, dog. Don't even trip.